Everyone has an anchor. From Hebrews we read, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. This from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. One of the earliest Christian symbols, one that was used even before the cross itself, was the anchor. Tour the catacombs of Rome, if you ever get that privilege, and you will find hundreds of anchors sketched on the walls. The anchor represented stability and safety to early believers. In the anchor, the persecuted church of the cross, hidden from those outside the faith, but evident to those who knew to look for it. And you notice, I don't know whether you've ever noticed in our stained glass window over here, the one that's by the pulpit, there's an anchor uh, with the sun in it and with a uh, rope wrapped around it, a sure and certain symbol. So where is your anchor anchored? To money and investments? What happens when the stock market crashes? If your li life is anchored to your spouse and your family, what happens when loved ones are taken from you? If your identity is anchored to your career, what happens when you are laid off? If your hope is anchored in the pursuit of pleasures and enjoyable experiences, what will you do when hard times come? Anchors like those just named have one thing in common. They're unreliable. When you set an anchor in sand, it will eventually fail. Pull loose, let go. Everyone has an anchor. However, our anchors are only as stable as the lake bottom or seabed, the holding ground in which they are set. To find stability in life, we need a firm holding ground. We need a place to set the anchor of our soul, trusting it will not move or shift like sand. The truth is that nothing in this world can promise us permanent security. Nothing in this world. We typically think of anchors that descend, falling through the water to rest at the bottom of a river or ocean. The anchor I have in mind, though, goes up, up to heaven. The anchor of our soul rests behind the veil. It is firmly set in the eternal holy of holies, in heaven, in the presence of God himself. How did this anchor get there? Jesus took it there. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of, of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as forerunner on our behalf. Our anchor will not fail. Our anchor will not slip. The anchor of our soul will not give way because it is set in the unchanging word of God. It is set in Jesus, our forerunner, in his life for us, his death in our place, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven. This is true security. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, without you, nothing is secure and nothing is reliable. Work in me and our brothers and sisters here at Uniontown a greater confidence in your faithfulness. Teach me to trust your promises, which never waver. Teach me to anchor my life in your word, making it the holding ground of my hope. Lord Jesus, you are our forerunner. You will guide us safely into heaven's harbor. Until then, thank you for your continuing blessings upon us as brothers and sisters, as the church here in Uniontown. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me, please? To you, Lord, be the glory. Great things you have done. Amen. I'd like to read a little bit of scripture this morning from the book of Luke, the 15th chapter, verses 1 to 3 and 11 uh, to uh, 24. Dishonest tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus' sermons. But this caused complaints from the Jewish religious leaders and the experts on law, Jewish law because he was associating with such despicable people, even eating with them. And then down to verse 11. A man had two sons. When the younger told his father, I want my share of your estate now, instead of waiting until you die. His father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and took a trip to a distant land, and there wasted all his money on parties and prostitutes. About the time his money was gone, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. 
He persuaded a local farmer to hire him to feed the pigs. The boy became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the swine looked good to him, and no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home even the hired men have food enough and to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired hand. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and was filled with loving pity and ran and embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you and am not worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the slaves, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him, and a jeweled ring on his finger and shoes, and kill the calf we have been fattening in the fattening pen. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has returned to life. He was lost and is found. So the party began. The party began. Good morning. This has been a red letter day in the life of this church. Uh, just, just fantastic. Just, and I am just so blessed to have been a part of... Um, Bob's um, being brought in as pastor of this church. It just does my heart good. Having said that it was a red letter day, there's a lot of good things on it. Did you know something else about March 27th? This being March 27th. March 27th is officially National Joe Day. National Joe Day. And I'm not kidding about that. That's true. I don't know who decides these things. You know what I mean? I mean like National Joe Day. Or how about March 22nd, just last week? You know what March 22nd is? National Goof Off Day. I celebrate that one every day. People in the office know that's the truth. How about March 25th? You know what that is? That's National Waffle Day. We like waffles. But March 27th, today, is designated as National Joe Day. It's a day for celebrating anyone with the name Joe. Do we have any Joes here this morning? I only know of one, and he's not here this morning. Okay, there you go, Joe. <laughs> yeah. In fact, the founder of National Joe Day invites all people to change their name to Joe for this one particular day so that their name Joe for one day can be Joe. For those of us who have trouble remembering names, I don't know who that was, who that is, besides me, National Joe Day is a great idea. So I'm going to call everyone Joe today and nobody can get mad at me. Bear that in mind. Some years ago, there was a national survey done measuring how well people like their given name. You know, people. some people don't like their name. About 21% said that they disliked their name so much that they would uh, consider changing it. So if you're part of the 21% that don't like the name you were given, then today's your day. For this one day, you see, you can change your name to Joe, and that's today. I think it's interesting that our scripture today falls on National Joe Day. Think about it, because it's a story of a young guy, a kid really, who wanted to make a major change in his life. A major, he didn't want to change his name, although maybe he did, I don't know. Instead, he wanted to, to get away from his family. Oh, he wanted to get away from the hometown. He wanted to get away, get away from that farm. He hated that farm. He wanted to make a new life for himself. He wanted to go to a faraway place, maybe an exotic place or something. 
even if it meant ending up in a place that he never imagined he'd be. He didn't care. He just wanted to go, wanted to get out of there. It's like a 49-year-old man from Germany named Erwin, who in 1977 spent all of his life savings to go on a special trip to the magical city of San Francisco, California. The flight that he had to San Francisco had a short layover in Bangor, Maine, before reaching its final destination. And while on the layover, a flight attendant uh, just casually wished Erwin a good time in San Francisco. And she was unaware that the German passenger didn't speak English. All he spoke was German, but he recognized the words San Francisco. And he assumed he had reached his destination. He got off the plane in Bangor, Maine, and began to tour the city. He wandered the streets of Bangor, Maine for three days before he discovered his mistake. A local family took him in. His story made it into the local newspapers. And a strange thing happened at that point. The residents of Bangor, Maine rallied around this lost foreigner. The locals threw Irwin a 50th birthday party. The Penobscot Indian Nation named him an honorary member. The, a local songwriter wrote a folk song about him. The Bangor government gave him a small parcel of land in northern Maine. Even the governor of Maine visited him. Within a week, within a week, Time magazine published an article about Irwin. And the Today Show did a piece on this seemingly former for, uh, foreigner who uh, received this hearty welcome and unexpected place in Bangor, Maine. Then um, the San Francisco Chronicle got head of the, uh, 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 hold of this story, and they couldn't be outdone either, so they, they paid for Irwin to come to San Francisco. And while in San Francisco, he met the mayor, he rode on a cable car, and he went to a rodeo. One year later, his whirlwind trip to the United States, Irwin returned to Bangor, Maine to visit where he, the folks who had uh, took him in and treated him so well a year before. And according to the local news, or the local property assessor, he continued to pay his taxes on the little plot of land that they gave him in Maine, even though he never did go back to see it. Now, wouldn't it be great if every story of being lost had a happy ending? And a lot of them do. They really do. But not all of them. But sometimes this trip to the faraway place takes takes us away from our, our sense of self. You know, we're lost. Our, our sense of security, we, we don't feel so secure. Or our sense of strength. Sometimes a trip to a faraway place ends up in brokenness of spirit and loss and regret. A university professor in Australia recruited 657 adults between the ages of 20 and 80. Now, 20 may not be an adult in some people's minds, but anyhow, between 80 and 20, and asked them to discuss the 10 biggest decisions they had to make in their life up to that point, whatever their age was. And after they processed all this and was and got all the, the, uh, the data in, the professor of the study reported that the most enduring regret in life of these people result from decisions that move you further away from the ideal person that you want to be. You know, everybody has an idea of what kind of person they want to be, but with different decisions that you make, sometimes it takes you away from that. And it makes sense, don't you think? I think? I think it's important to point out that we have all made decisions that have moved us further away from the person that we wanted to be when we started out. 
We've all made decisions that have moved us further away from the ideal person that God made us to be also. And that's exactly what sin is. Moving away from God's perfect character and perfect will. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So today's Bible story that I read is good news for all of us. It's good news for everybody. It's about this kid who rebels, okay? He rebels against his family. He asks for his share of the family inheritance so that he can go off on a distant land and start a new life. I don't like it here. I want to get out of here. You're, you're, you're holding me back. I, I can't be myself. The end result was he squandered his fortune, wild living, and he ended up broke and alone, and he's in this foreign land. He don't know anybody. Then a famine hits. There's nothing to eat. People are starving to death, and the kid comes. He's desperate, desperate, and he's hungry, and he hires himself out to a, a pig farmer just to keep from starving to death. And feeding pigs was rock bottom for the most shameful job that any young Jewish boy could have. Feeding pigs, no. But he did because he was hungry and he was desperate. So this kid who had rejected his father, lost his inheritance, and brought shame on his whole family, and according to Old Testament custom, Testament custom was worthy to be put to death just because of the things he did. This is one of Jesus' most famous stories. Jesus told a lot of stories. This is one of the most famous ones. But Jesus' stories are never just about the story. They're not. Every story Jesus told is an introduction to God's heart. If you've ever wanted to know what God is like, then this story is for you. And if you truly want to understand the nature of God's heart, then always look who Jesus' audience is. Who's listening? Jesus never just told a story to entertain people or to instruct people. He told stories to draw people closer to God. That was the whole purpose of him telling stories. So he was very careful, you see, to choose the right story for the right audience. So this story begins with the words, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. The sinners and tax collectors, because they were all lumped together, and they all come around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees, you see, and the teachers of the law muttered under their breath. You know how they do. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus tells them this parable. That's when he brings it out. This is it. What do these verses tell us about God's heart? This little story here. And that's, this is not the whole story. It goes on. I just wanted to get that, this first kid. Okay? Jesus is telling his audience of outcasts that God welcomes you. You are important to me, he says. You're not a project. You're not a charity cake case. But I, you're my friend. There is healing, you see, in acceptance. Jesus' instructions with others were remarkably open. Everybody was welcome. He noticed people that other people overlooked. He touched people that were judged untouchable. He had no walls of acceptability around him. And his openness caused the local religious leaders to view him with 
suspicion and contempt. They didn't like him. Even today, we struggle to just accept and to love people as who they are. Every day, that kind of love is called radical. When you love somebody that is unlovable, that's radical love. In 1989, Mother Teresa visited Phoenix, Arizona to open up a homeless shelter. There was a huge celebration planned, and the city welcomed her, and they wanted to hear her speak. She was also invited to do a radio interview. Before the interview, the radio host asked Mother Teresa if there was anything that he could do to help her work. And he was accustomed to lending his celebrity to various charities and making donations to good causes. But that's not what Mother Teresa wanted from him. Instead, she said, yes, there is. Find somebody that nobody else loves and love them. Find somebody that nobody loves and love them. That's how Jesus lived his life. He found the people that nobody loved, the people who had been told that God could never love them, and he loved them. He made the, them the center of his attention. He made them the good guys in his stories. That's the whole reason he was telling the story. That's the point of every one of Jesus' stories. This was the point of his life. This was why he was here. That's what led him to the cross just to connect with God. What does this story tell us about God? Well, first and foremost, it tells us that we, you and I, are welcomed. Jesus is also telling his audience of outcasts, and we can be considered in the outcast group, that God is waiting for them. Waiting. So Jesus continues his story. The son's starving, okay? And he's desperate. So he decides to head home and beg for mercy. Now he knew that he had destroyed any chance of rejoining the family. He just knew that. He destroyed any chance for forgiveness. But he thought to himself, I'll confess my sin to my father and tell him to just put me on as a hired hand. That's all I need. Just, just put me on as a hired hand. If you've ever thought you've gone so far away from God's ideals that you are no longer worthy to be called God's child, then you understand the younger son's decision, don't you? Then Jesus says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Hear it again. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. The father who had been rejected by his boy the father who had been shamed by his son's actions. That guy, that father, was standing at the window waiting for his son to come home. He probably was at the same, stayed at that window every night that he had been gone, looking for him. That's how he saw him, when he was still a long way off. And the father didn't wait for the son to make that long journey down the driveway to the front doorstep. He didn't wait for that boy to, to repent and apologize. It says, while he was still a long way off, the father ran to him and threw his arms around him and kissed him. God is waiting to welcome us home if we've strayed, and we all have. Ooh. 
God is waiting to restore you. He is. No matter how far away you may have gone from God's character and God's will, God is saying through Jesus, let's just pick up the pieces and see what we can make out of what's left. You know, let's just try to put it all back. It's like breaking a big old crock or something. Let's see if we can't just put it all back together with what pieces are left. And this isn't just a moment of restoration. It's a moment of celebration. Jesus' story ends with these words. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Bring a ring, put it on his finger, and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. There's a story about a teenage boy, and this is a true story also, who rebelled against his family. He came increasingly estranged from them. And one night he got arrested for drunk driving. And his mother had to pick him up at the jail. And that was one long ride home. The kid could only imagine the angry words that his mother was holding in on their way home at night. The next day, the mom presented her son with a small gift wrap package box. And inside the box, when he opened it up, there was a rock. Just a rock. And the kid said, hey, this is cute, Mom. What's this for? He rolled his eyes. He's giving me a kid to do. She said, read the card. And inside the box there was a card. The card read this. This rock is more than 200 million years old. And that's how long it will take before I give up on you. God is never giving up on us. Never. We are accepted. We are loved. We are welcomed. We are waited for. That was the message of Jesus' life and the motivation for his death to show us that God would give everything he has to save us and restore us and bring us home again. Amen? Amen. You see, that's the story of Easter. We've been in Lent now for a few weeks, and Easter's coming. This is the story of Easter. God is running to meet you with open arms through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, that our sins would be forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen. God's always there for us. Jesus is there with his arms wide open waiting for us. You never, 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 never go too far. You just have to turn around and come home. That's all that's required. Just turn around and come home. No matter what, what you did, what you said, just come home. God's there with open arms. He's running to you and me. Would you pray with me? God, we just... Thank you so much for this time we've had in your house. We know that you're there with open arms waiting for us. Sometimes we stray, sometimes we turn our back on you, but you're always there to take us home. And we just thank you, Lord, for that. Until we meet again, amen. <laughs>